Uh, first, uh, I want to uh, give a brief comment on uh, two types of temporary uh, basic income proposals that have been made uh, in uh, connection with the current crisis. Two, I'll uh, say something about how this leads to further support uh, for uh, permanent uh, basic income, but at the same time that in the post-corona uh, time, there will be uh, new obstacles to the implementation of uh, this permanent basic income. And then uh, finally, briefly, I'll say uh, a few words um, uh, first on the, the outcome of the Finnish experiment, uh, final report on which was published uh, about 10 years, 10 days ago. And finally, I'll say something about the ECI, so the new, the second European Citizens Initiative around basic income. So first, uh, it's important to see that uh, there has been this uh, upsurge of interest in two types, uh, distinct types in, uh, of uh, temporary basic income, each with their own objectives, each with their own way of uh, funding uh, the proposal. One, sometimes called an emergency universal basic income, uh, is proposed in order to help everyone, to make sure that everyone has enough to live on uh, during the time of the lockdown. Uh, lockdown has taken different shapes in different countries, but uh, has uh, taken a form that in all countries has, met, has uh, meant significant material hardship for many people. And so it has been said, uh, that uh, the simplest way, the quickest way of making sure that everyone uh, gets enough to live on is simply to give for the time and for the number of months uh, that uh, the lockdown lasts to give everyone uh, enough to live on. How can it be paid? Just through deficit spending, through increasing the public debt. If it doesn't last too long, uh, this should be uh, bearable. Um, of course, some people have immediately said, but wouldn't it be better to focus this money, to make it less expensive, by focusing the money on the people who've lost their income, not give it to everyone? Yes, uh, this, this, that's an argument, but then it takes time to identify these people, to inform them about what they're entitled to, to create a bureaucracy that will verify the conditions and so on, and by that time, uh, the lockdown may be over, then some people may have starved. And so that's the reason why some people have been proposing that, of course, only for the short, for the short term, for the duration of the lockdown. Then you have a second type of proposal that applies to the end of the lockdown, when economic activity needs to be uh, restarted. And that's then often called uh, quantitative easing for the people. There, the idea is that the central bank in the case uh, of the European Union, or most of the European Union, the European Central Bank, uh, has to issue money in order to boost uh, the demand for uh, the uh, production and thereby to also uh, boost uh, production in that context and the GDP, uh, etc. Usually it's done, this so-called quantitative easing is done via the banks by enabling the banks to, um, to, to um, provide cheap loans both to households and to firms, but that technique has reached uh, its limits and therefore it has been increasingly proposed to give money straight to the people. Here again you might say, well, why not target it more to the people who will spend more of it, not to the people who have any way too much money, but it's so much simpler not to have a, a cutoff point and anyway, you can make it uh, taxable. You can say, well, well, what is distributed in this way? If it's 500 euros, 1,000 euros in order to reboot the economy, uh, that can be taxed. And of course, you get that a significant proportion of that back from the rich people, while for uh, the poorer people, it's a uh, net benefit. And hopefully, they will spend it. Here again, it's only for the short term, not during the lockdown, as we get out of it. And as soon as there are not too many uh, supply side uh, constraints and that uh, all the shops and the businesses can start again, uh, but uh, it can be done once, it can be done twice, but not permanent. So these are the two types of short term proposals. Of course, this has also an impact on uh, the plausibility and the defensibility of basic income as a permanent uh, um, setup. 
Why? First, because once you've admitted that it makes sense, even for a short period, to give an income to everyone, rich and poor, without conditions, those willing to work and not, without checking the family situation, then you may be more open to the idea of giving it on a permanent basis. More importantly, people have been thinking about what it would have meant to have this shock with the basic income in place already. So it doesn't mean that you wouldn't have needed some additional measures in order to protect some people's incomes that had fallen dramatically, but you could have done so against the background of a strong floor no? that would be guaranteed without any question asked, without delay to every single person, every single household in the country. So you would have needed some additional measures, but uh, far less expensive uh, on top of what is being financed in a sustainable way uh, in the form of a basic income. And of course, the, the, it would have been less urgent. I mean, people would not have been starving in, immediately because, um, because they would have been able to rely on this basic income. Also, if you think about the rebooting of the economy at the end of the crisis, it would then be much easier to do it if you have the pipeline in place. It's gen then just a matter of increasing the level of the basic income on a temporary uh, basis, uh, of course, by creating some inflation, but at a time when inflation uh, is uh, needed. And beyond all that, so because people have been, uh, some people have been uh, uh, sort of reaching this idea of a permanent basic income in this way, thinking, in fact, we would have been better equipped. Our societies, our economies would have been more resilient if that had been in place. And then, of course, this is just one additional argument, one on top of all the arguments we are familiar with, um, and that uh, uh, remain as uh, valid as ever, or at least with some qualification. Now I turn to uh, the, so the, the other aspect I uh, wanted to uh, stress. Isn't there, and there are some dimensions or some aspects under which a basic income would be more difficult to implement in a post-corona world. I'll mention three difficulties, three obstacles. First obstacle, of course, there is all this massive focus of attention on the healthcare system. Um, people in the healthcare system in most countries have been saying, look, we were insufficiently equipped to face this sort of challenge. We need more investment, also material investment in the healthcare system. Look, all these people who do highly valuable work, some might be well paid, the, the doctors, the specialists, but some are, are very important, equally important. Many, um, all the nurses who work uh, in the system, even the cleaners and so on, but they are very poorly paid. So we need to massively invest to spend more on healthcare. But if we spend more on healthcare, more broadly on public services, won't less money be available for a basic income? And even if we were to introduce a basic income, wouldn't that then, by giving more bargaining power to badly paid nurses, wouldn't that me make the healthcare system more expensive than it is now? In some countries, it's already over 10% of GDP per capita, uh, of GDP that is spent on uh, healthcare. So that's the first difficulty. Uh, won't there be a, a, a pressure towards spending more on healthcare? Second difficulty, um, the post-corona time, certainly for a significant period, uh, will have to suffer from a lower productivity. That is, uh, there are lots of investments, public and private, that have been made that won't be uh, used optimally. Just think about public transport for a, a significant period. And that means if you take uh, the economy as a whole, a lower productivity. Um, this, you may say, well, who cares about productivity? Well, you do need to care about productivity because, and to put it very simply, um, the productivity, high productivity means a large surplus in the economy uh, over and above what needs to be allocated to the factors of production, labor, uh, capital, um, entrepreneurship, and it is out of this surplus uh, that a basic income is to be funded. So we need to watch what happens uh, to uh, productivity. 
especially, and that's the third aspect of a, a post-corona world, especially as after uh, this relief for the earth, uh, which and for the environment, which uh, uh, has been the, the, this, uh, this uh, lockdown period, and so less pollution, less uh, uh, CO2 uh, production, etc., will be back and the, the economy will, will start again and will face again these environmental uh, constraints. In uh, that means because of climate change, exhaustion of, uh, of uh, natural uh, resources. And that is a further constraint, of course, on our productivity and a further difficulty for the ability to generate that surplus and to keep generate in a sustainable way that surplus out of which uh, basic income is being produced. What follows from all that? That we should shelve all hopes of uh, introducing a basic income in the short or the medium term? No, not at all. Just it does affect some of the arguments. I think we what we must shelve is simplistic arguments. It consists in saying automation is producing such a high uh, level of productivity that all these workers will be made uh, redundant. There won't be work for everyone. That's a very flimsy, uh, weak argument. That's not an argument we should use. But uh, that's one implication. There are lots of other arguments we can keep using. But um, another aspect is that we must keep arguing, as many uh, do, keep arguing for a basic income in combination uh, as a close complement to lifelong learning. And a lifelong learning that constantly combines uh, uh, what the mobilization of what is available, uh, the, the tremendous amount of knowledge that's available cheaply, free of charge on the internet, with appropriation, critical and creative, by local communities in all sorts of ways, formal and informal. That is what will enable us to keep being productive, not only as uh, producers in the strict sense, in uh, the, the work sphere, in the professional sphere, but also as consumers, as users of public services, as neighbors in our communities. And so we really need to have a view about the future that combines this transformation of distribution of labor, putting a floor uh, below all the distribution of labor combined with this lifelong learning. And of course, a basic income is one way of making that much easier by making the transitions between uh, employment, uh, training in broader sense, education in broader sense, and voluntary activities within the household and outside. Basic income makes that transition much smoother, much easier, more flexible than uh, what we have uh, now. Let me then turn to the short uh, re final remarks, so one about uh, the, fin the, the Finnish experiment and uh, one about the ECI. On the Finnish experiment, so uh, as you might know, uh, there was a, a preliminary report that was based essentially on the uh, data, on some interviews at the end of the second year of the experiment, it was a two-year experiment, and then on data about employment uh, only for the first year of the experiment. Then 10 days ago, we had the final report that had the, the full data for the two years. So what did we learn uh, from it? We knew already from last year that people and the, the beneficiaries at the end of the two years were happier than in the control group. Uh, they seemed to be more healthy, they were less stressed, had more uh, trust in uh, each other and uh, or in other people and in, uh, in, in the public uh, authorities. But what about the employment uh, record? Let's bear in mind that the experiment consisted in taking 2,000 people out of 150,000 people who were long-term unemployed, people who had never worked before, aged between 25 and 59, or who uh, had not worked in the last two years. And so these 2,000 people were told now for two years, you'll get the same 560 euros per month, but unconditionally. Doesn't matter with whom you live, doesn't matter whether you earn some money in addition, doesn't matter whether you turn down a job, stop looking for a job, uh, etc. no one will bother you. And then the question was, will these 2,000 people work more or less than the 150,000 people? Because some people say, well, they will work less because they are no, no longer bothered, pushed into work by uh, some uh, uh, officials. And other people will say, no, they can be expected to work more because they can combine their basic income with 
earnings from oil. So what did the experiment show? In the first year, no significant difference. Very tiny difference, a bit more among the basic income recipients, slightly, but not statistically significant. Second year, there is a statistically uh, a significant uh, difference to the advantage of the basic income recipients. But with a number of uh, remarkable aspects. For example, there is no difference for the three quarters of the people, no significant difference for the three quarters of the people who are of local origin, who are of Finnish origin. But for the one quarter of the people of foreign origin, uh, of uh, immigrant origin, there there is a very big difference. They work on average 14 days more than uh, the equivalent people, same background in the control group. So there is, uh, and so the, that means the outcome is uh, uh, so certainly it falsifies the view and uh, it prevents people from saying, look, even if we enable these people to combine uh, their benefit with uh, work, they don't work more than otherwise. This is not true. They did work uh, more on average uh, than others, but not all of them did. And so it's interesting to see what difference uh, it makes. Does it show, does it do anything to show that a basic income is sustained of 560 euros per month is sustainable or unsustainable? No, not at all. It doesn't teach us anything about that. Because of course, what this tiny minority of long-term unemployment does is insignificant for the sustainability, the economic sustainability of a basic income. What uh, matters is uh, to see what the workers, the people who are currently working, uh, would do if a basic income was introduced and nothing in the experiment enabled us to give an answer to uh, that question. But certainly the basic income experiment is no embarrassment whatever for the people who support uh, basic income. Final remark then, uh, the uh, ECI, the new uh, ECI. I'm uh, very happy that uh, this is uh, happening. I think the previous, uh, uh, the previous ECI also that was launched in 2013 uh, of course, didn't reach the target of 1 million. Uh, it was less than 300,000, but with signatures, uh, some signatures in all 28 uh, member states. And uh, it had a number of uh, extremely good results, including the very existence of uh, UBI uh, Europe, which uh, was born in this context. And for me, it's a very important network because now that the EU has real uh, power directly and indirectly in, in matters of social policy. It's very important to have, in addition to bien on the world level, to have uh, a network focus, focusing on what can be done at the level of the European Union. I also think that it was clever on the part of the initiators to connect that to this uh, uh, statement, to the passage in that uh, common statement by the Parliament, the Council and uh, the uh, Commission and that uh, said, and I'll quote the full sentence, which is only partly quoted in uh, the proposal, and the, the, that sentence, that statement said, to combat uh, inequality, the EU and its member states will also support efficient, sustainable, and equitable social protection systems to guarantee basic income, prevent relapses into extreme poverty, and build resilience. Mm -hmm. The quote stopped after basic income. Now it's a bit misleading because in the French translation, the French version of the text, it says, uh, uh, pour garantir un revenu minimum. It doesn't speak about the revenu de base. The German, the Italian, the Spanish, etc., do have the expression basic income. So surely, the, I think as is acknowledged by the initiators, the, the, the authors of, uh, of this text, didn't mean really basic income in the sense in which uh, we mean it. But that do mean uh, a social protection system that would guarantee this, um, this uh, guarantee, minimum uh, guarantee minimum floor, prevent relapses into extreme poverty and build resilience. And of course, all this is very important for the advantages of a basic income over uh, the uh, other ways, the more traditional ways of trying to secure uh, minimal level uh, of protection. So I do think that uh, the, this justification makes sense. What is not clear to me, and some of you will be able to enlighten me, is um, to what extent uh, the proposal is really only for basic incomes 
uh, at the level of each member state. So funded, organized, structured at the level of each member state. But that would seem that the, the most obvious interpretation also given that basic incomes is in the plural in uh, the title of the proposal. But at the same time, it says in the objective they should reduce regional disparities in order to strengthen the economic, social and territorial cohesion in the EU. And of course, when social cohesion, social cohesion funds, etc., are used in the EU, it's also part, uh, partly to refer to uh, the uh, inequalities possible, the reduction of the divergence between member states. And that requires that at least part of the basic income operation should be at the level of uh, the EU. So that's uh, what I wanted to throw in at the beginning of uh, this uh, General Assembly. So I think uh, the ECI is again a wonderful moment to, uh, a wonderful occasion to mobilize people, make more people aware of the idea, think ourselves a bit more about the various arguments, the various uh, objections that can be made against the idea. So I congratulate the people who made the proposal and who got it approved by the uh, European Commission uh, for uh, this uh, second uh, attempt to reach this one million signatures. I'm sure it's possible now to get there. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, uh, <clears throat> for this uh, wonderful uh, intro introduction. Uh, and ideas. Um, we already have a few questions uh, in the Q&A uh, tool, so I would uh, like to encourage everyone uh, to ask your questions there, but please uh, restrict it to really questions. Everything else you can say in the chat so I uh, don't lose uh, the overview. Um, so, for example, Barb uh, is asking, in the UK, there has been a lot of talk about supporting unpaid care in relation to basic income. What do you think about these arguments, this discussion? Yeah. Very briefly, yes. Uh, I mean, as Barbara knows, knows uh, this uh, is a recurrent uh, theme um, in uh, the basic income uh, movement. And so it's, uh, there is, um, and the, the, you talk about, think about care in general, and so basic income would have two sorts of impacts. One is that it would give some sort of uh, uh, financial autonomy uh, for the people who are currently doing care work on a totally uh, voluntary basis and uh, unpaid uh, basis. So it would give them an income of their own right rather than have to get it from, the, from their partner, from uh, the person they help, etc. And the other impact, of course, is to strengthen the bargaining position of the care workers who are now currently who in, the, in the paid sector, but who are currently badly paid. So I do think that basic income and the whole care uh, uh, theme uh, are closely related. Okay, there is a next question uh, that seems to be a little bit more uh, general from Antonis. Isn't against human rights to tie a citizen's mean to survival to paid labor? Uh, well, I think, so if we look at the, uh, what is a human right? Huh? Uh, if we mean by human right, uh, what is uh, meant to be protected by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, there, there, is, a, uh, there is clearly a right to, uh, for every human being to have adequate means of subsistence. But uh, nothing in that text implies that this guarantee should take the form of an unconditional basic income. It is compatible with the idea that this, uh, the level of subsistence should be guaranteed taking family composition into account. It does need to be strictly individual. It is uh, compatible with the idea that people are expected to work, but that the people who cannot have access to work or who because they are sick or because, uh, they are, uh, or, or because they are handicapped or because they are involuntary and unemployed, that they should get access to means of subsistence in a different way. But nothing indicates that it should be an obligation-free right to a minimum income. So, of course, what we may then want to speculate further and say, yes, but it's not only what uh, can be taken as the best uh, legal interpretation of what's in the in the Declar Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We 
yes, of course, we can try to do so. But um, I think there are other arguments that are better and less rhetorical than that. Um, so we, we are starting to have lots of questions. Uh, so I will uh, not necessarily ask uh, in, in the order they were asked because we also have just limited time uh, remaining. Um, there is a question uh, I found interesting from Philippe Coffin. Uh, have you seen uh, new alliances uh, being triggered through Corona in the political debate, for example, uh, with, uh, also in the business world? Uh, uh, are, are there voices coming from the business world in, in favor of basic income now? Yes, well, uh, uh, certainly for the short term uh, basic income, uh, you had a much broader coalition. And so there are some people uh, indeed, uh, I mean, what you saw even in the US, uh, so you have uh, even uh, Trump and people close, uh, close to Trump saying then for the emergency basic income to get people out of, out of the, 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 the hardship of, of the lockdown. So you have a a very broad alliance uh, that says, okay, let's do that for a limited period. Also for the quantitative easing for the people, a number of very mainstream economists have been uh, proposing uh, things like that. But what uh, I noticed, I just received yesterday the, the, a message from uh, the Secretary General of um, the uh, Belgium's Christian Mutualities. And the Christian Mutualities they are the biggest uh, organization, all categories in uh, Belgium. So because the, our healthcare system passes through that. And he put a, a, a PS at the end of his message and he said, isn't this the ideal moment to uh, propose a, a basic income? Uh, because we realize how many are, I mean, all the complication of all the special system we have to put into place in order to deal with this sort of challenge. That's a variant of, uh, version of the argument I, I mentioned before. If we had had a basic income in place before this shock, we would have been far better equipped in order to face it. And that uh, you can also also hear, I could see uh, uh, there were some people in business or usually associated closely with uh, businesses who were uh, holding arguments of that type because they realized how much time it takes them to to uh, to deploy all these various schemes, sometimes quite complicated, specific to different categories. On the whole, in a country like Belgium, they cover a, a very large proportion of the population, but it often takes time and it's complicated. And then it's some are of short duration, some of bigger, of larger duration. Some then end up with a, with a benefit higher than what they would get through their professional activities and get thereby in some sort of, of trap. So people say, well, come on, let's have, if only something modest that would have made all this easier. And so that's how the, the coalition in favor of it uh, widens, yeah, as suggested by the question. So uh, we are um, unfortunately uh, at the end of time that we have planned for uh, this discussion. Uh, I would uh, use, I, I would put a final question uh, from Thomas Necker. Uh, he's asking what gives us the confidence that we will reach the 1 million signatures in the ECI this time. Uh, I would probably add, what would you say are the best arguments that Corona gives us also in view what you mentioned, the resistance that we, we uh, can expect uh, in future. So what are the best arguments with which we can convince people to support the ECI now? Yeah. Um, so, I, I think whether or not we reach the one million will depend mainly on the organizational abilities. That is, we, and it's important, and that's a big difference with last time. There is some time before uh, triggering the, the, the collection of, uh, of the signatures. Last time it was as soon, on the day it was approved by the Commission, uh, the, the, the clock started running and then you had only these 12 months in order to collect. So here there is some time to prepare it. If it's launched in September or so, well, the, it's important to use this time well. And then to make sure that it's very clear for everyone how to sign, how to sign that the website should be very, very adequate. And uh, the, it's important also that 
on the website, there should be arguments phrased in an intelligible way and giving priority to those that may appeal most uh, to uh, the people. And so I think that um, related to several things that I said, it's really this idea, and the, the, there are two things that need to be combined. And so one related to Corona is this idea of this buffer, and that we'd be better equipped, and the, this notion of resilience, and that we are better equipped than to stomach these shocks. There will be other shocks, and some more local shocks, like the, the, the recession we had and the Euro crisis, and, and then global shocks like this one, completely unexpected. And whatever the shocks are, if we have this, this floor on which we can all stand, that creates an automatic solidarity between everyone that makes us better equipped, not only as a society, but also as an economy. Our economy is strong. And then, but that needs to be combined. We must make clear at the same time that this is not the most fundamental argument. Even if there were no shocks, basic income would be an important idea under current conditions because of a globalization that will not go away, certainly for the services it will not decrease, for the goods it will decrease, and with a, a technological change that, that will keep uh, going on. And in, in that context, we really need this strong floor also to limit the, the polarization of incomes and to be combined with this constant learning process. And so everyone must be, uh, every citizen must be a learner in a relaxed way without uh, and, uh, being but a, but a constant learner in order to be able in the end to work more years in, in, in one's life and to work more efficiently because and, and, and the core idea being that uh, freedom, the freedom given to people is an important factor of production, of productivity. Right? Make it possible for people to choose what they want to do with their lives and uh, they will be doing it better and it must, of course, be something which they'll take, take pleasure in doing because it's also useful then to others than themselves. So it's really these two things, resilience, a, a good buffer against all crises, but at the same time, something that thanks to this freedom that's given to all can make our society more productive and our economy uh, uh, more sane and, uh, most, and strong. So that's my, and I'll certainly contribute, try and do my best to to help in uh, reaching the one million. Thank you, Philip, very much. I think that was a really excellent starter. Uh, lots of uh, food for thought, uh, lots of uh, important things uh, for our discussion in the next two days. And I would also like to thank everybody uh, for their questions, their comments. Uh, it is very obvious that this, uh, this topic is uh, not it's too big for just a half an hour uh, but we have our wonderful new format basic income tea which we will pick up uh, as of next weekend again so maybe philip will have the time to come back to one of those uh, webinars and then we can explore these uh, thoughts these ideas uh, further and, and then also ask some of the other questions we received yeah. so thank you very much again Keep going and I'll follow. I won't be able to be there all the time, but I'll keep following. <laughs>